Good morning. And a good friend of mine who's a doctor of psychology told me about this. And it's about logical thinking. In World War II, U.S. Air Force were losing a phenomenal amount of aircraft. And they wanted to look at the damage and work out how to make the aircraft safer and stronger. I mean, the sad statistic is if you are flying a bomber for the U.S. Air Force in World War II, your average survival rate was 10 missions. Now, you remember the amazing film Memphis Bell? Now, the thing about Memphis Bell was the plane survived over 30 missions, and that was a carrot that was dangled for the U.S. airmen to, you know, if you survive 30 missions, you got to go home. I mean, no one ever did. I mean, it's very sad. Anyway, back to the plane. Now, follow this carefully, because it's fascinating. So, bombers were damaged when they returned here, here, all in the midsection. The tails were blown off and the other wingtip. So these were the three, four areas of common damage. And so engineers started to look at um, how they could strengthen the wingtips, the center section, and the tail of planes, because this was the damage that they saw from planes when they returned. <laughs> I think you're gonna see what I'm gonna say. A brilliant engineer and statistician said, you have got this all wrong. What we're looking at here are the damage of planes that returned, the survivors. So in fact, strengthening the wingtips, the center section and the tail is exactly 100% the wrong thing to do. The weak areas of this aircraft are in fact the engines, the nose and the cockpit. The bits that you never saw come back to airbase damaged because the plane was destroyed. This reversal is a very good way of looking at the world. And there are some other classic examples. Let's look at one of the most famous, which is train brakes. Back when railways were first invented, there were tons of crashes. Making trains faster and heavier was all the rage, but making them stop was never considered important. So a genius came along called Westinghouse. He had seen an Italian and French engineer had used compressed air to make drills work to build tunnels. Why couldn't he use air pressure to squeeze the brakes? So fitting a compressor to the engine, high pressure air was pumped through pipes that squeezed the brake blocks onto the wheels. It stopped the train. But if the pipes ever burst, the brakes were released. Just like the World War II plane damage, a genius turned this idea on its head. Instead of blowing air down the pipe, they sucked the air out of the pipe. The brakes were inherently on, and the vacuum system pulls the brakes off the wheels so the train can roll. That means that if the pipes ever burst, a vacuum is applied and the brakes automatically go on. Duh! And that's roughly how they still work today. I have this other friend who's a genius filmmaker and knows a lot about aeroplanes. His story 
is similar to the Westinghouse train brakes. We are now lined up on the ILS beam uh, in line with the runway. We're descending down the glide path and we have completed the checklist. That is, we have lowered the undercarriage and flaps and made all the actions necessary to carry out an automatic landing. When autopilots were first fitted to airliners, it was thought that they would reduce the number of accidents. So the autopilot was made to fly the plane. The pilots just monitored that the autopilot was doing the right job. Aircraft manufacturers have tried to fix that problem by designing the pilot out of the cockpit. This is the first fully automated plane flown by a computer. Plane crashes increased. Pilots love to fly the airplane and in fact humans are very bad at monitoring computer systems. So the whole idea was turned on its head. Today, the pilots fly the planes, but if they mess up, the computer autopilot fixes the problem. Air travel has never been safer. So often a reversal of what you might first think is a solution to a problem is the better solution. And history is full of this same story. This happened in World War I. Statisticians decided to issue helmets to the troops. And guess what happened? The numbers of injured rose only because more survived. Writer Rishab Nahar perfectly explains this survival basis theory. He says it's a tendency to focus on the survivors rather than whatever you could call a non-survivor. After any event that leaves behind only survivors. The non-survivors are destroyed or removed from the statistics. This makes failures invisible because we naturally only focus on the few that had success. I've worked on many history films and they always strike me as only ever talking to the survivors and the winners. A classic example was a documentary about Auschwitz. Wonderful interviews with half a dozen Auschwitz survivors. All of them had lucky or amazing escape or survival stories. Of course, we didn't talk to the millions who died. Keep sending me fantastic stories and remember, the truth is out there.